Uh, dear colleagues, it's great pleasure for me today to moderate a webinar organized uh, of, by Working Group One among the cost action, globalization, illicit trade, sustainability, and security. And it will be the second webinar uh, of our working group. Today, we will have two prominent speeches from researchers from Nor Nor Norway and uh, Slovak. And the first researcher, Dr. Samuel Andrew Harty from Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Research, will present topic looting and trafficking of antiquities during Russia's war on Ukraine. Samuel is a cultural property criminologist who has investigated theft and trafficking of art and antiquities from zones of conflict and crisis such as Cyprus, Turkey, Syria, and Ukraine. He is now working for the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Studies as part of project on destructive exploitation and care of cultural objects and professional public education for sustainable heritage management in relation to Russia's aggression against Ukraine under the Joint Programming Initiative on Cultural Heritage. So, Sam, the floor is yours, please. Thanks. Yeah, I, I've been working on the connections between uh, cultural property crime and political violence since my PhD in Cyprus, um, which was almost 20 years ago now. Uh, and I've been following the situation in, in Ukraine since 2014, uh, initially just because I had uh, friends there and from there and I was concerned and the more I looked at it the more I saw similarities and uh, causes for greater concern so I've been working on it more and more again almost for for 10 years now um, happily increasingly with uh, Ukrainian colleagues who um, who've been striving and uh, managing to to carry on doing this uh, research and and counter trafficking action on top of obviously um, now especially uh, military service and uh, humanitarian aid and community care and uh, everything else that they've had to uh, to bear on top of their uh, everyday work. And before I start getting lost in uh, some of the crazy edges of the, uh, the problem, it might help to give my conclusion first, which is that there has long been a problem with illegal collecting by politically exposed persons. Um, particularly since the 24th of February 2022, there has been politically motivated uh, Russian state organized expropriation, which is not going onto the market. There has been profit driven Russian state permitted pillaging of things which are going into private collections and are going uh, onto the market. Uh, but there also also been low level, practically unpoliced looting across all of the territories of all of the warring parties that predates the conflict and it will persist after the conflict. Um, but it has been affected in various ways by the conflict. Um, and some of that looting is undertaken by law enforcement agents. Again, that's something that happens everywhere there was a police officer in the uk who was convicted of uh breaking even the uk's pathetically weak 
cultural property law. Um, but it is noticeable in Eastern Europe. Uh, there has been military or paramilitary collaboration of cultural property criminals with armed forces and armed groups. And there has been a politicization, a greater politicization of the fact of cultural property crime. So this problem is now being used as an instrument of propaganda in the war. Uh, and it's also worth noting that this activity or the people who are involved in this activity are being used uh, as instruments of espionage. So despite the pathetically weak querying of people in and around the market, it is very clear that Russian soldiers are indeed stealing cultural objects uh, in the same way that they're committing far more horrific crimes. And it says something about the attitudes of the people in and around the market that they are willing uh, to try to deny or query or uh, undermine the the knowledge of the fact of this uh, activity particularly when we're discussing people who are involved in uh, a program of genocide but as we can see from uh, historic buildings as well as uh, cultural collections um, and as I will show you in relation to archaeological sites, we do know for sure that armed forces and armed groups are involved, even if it's only at the level of the individuals, not as a matter of orders from the top. And I think it's important to remember that that doesn't make it better or less harmful. It only reflects the process, the, the, the structure of the operation. So they're not being given orders, but they are being allowed to commit these crimes. And committing these crimes is part of the incentive structure for their participation in the war. And this kind of activity has been going on since the start of the war, or even before it, if you consider the, the activity in and around the revolution, where uh, the revolution of dignity, um, where um, the forces of the regime during the revolution, before it was overthrown, they ransacked uh, buildings under their control and their supporters ransacked uh, museums that they could access. So again, there is very good evidence, forensic evidence, of the fact that elements within states have been involved in theft and trafficking. But we also know that so, uh, this happens on all sides and at very disorganized levels. So, uh, during and after the revolution, some of the pro revolutionary protesters were taking broken pieces of communist statues or other things like that and selling them or bartering them in order to get um, funds for their side in the conflict. And we know, as you can see from the photos on the left, that some of the people buying these things are very senior. Uh, these photos aren't things that were bought during the revolution. These were things that were found during the revolution in the residence of the president and the prosecutor general. So these were things they'd collected possibly or probably with dirty money, um, 
and they may themselves have been stolen goods. And obviously, when you have a collector who is the prosecutor, the prosecutor is unlikely to prosecute the thieves and dealers. And that's a very broad problem in Eastern Europe. It's a very broad problem in Western Europe as well, but the, we the laws are weaker. And the UK's attitude has often been to uh, legalise corruption rather than uh, fail to prosecute it. But you can see from uh, figures like presidents, prime ministers, um, close associates, assistants, that there are a lot of high level untouchable characters in Ukraine and Russia and Belarus who are involved in some way in either uh, buying illegal antiquities like uh, Vyacheslav uh, Bugslev and um, uh, Valery Khorvatov or laundering money through art like Arkady Rottenberg um, or, and Paul Manafort. Um, and the people lower down the food chain in this criminal business know the situation. Which creates a horrible system of, of legal nihilism where their attitude towards the law is that it is not a matter of a moral code. It's not a matter even of uh, a legal code. It's a matter of political power. So uh, if you get caught, bad luck. Uh, if you get punished, worse luck. But why were you doing it without protection? You can see those kinds of statements, sometimes almost word for word, uh, not only in Ukraine and Russia, but also in Turkey and Serbia and elsewhere. So this is emblematic of the problem with the crime in general, but also very particularly of why the situation exists the way it does uh, in Ukraine and Russia and Belarus. And it's also clear that beyond the untouchables at the top end, there are the untouched at the bottom end who know they're vulnerable. Uh, there are conversations among looters where they talk about the fact that they have been uh, detained, sometimes arrested, and put on lists by police forces and uh, intelligence agencies, but not prosecuted. And the reason they haven't been prosecuted is because uh, they're being left to be vulnerable, to know that if they uh, engage in dissidents, they can be prosecuted for these offences. If they don't give information, so smugglers who have information about uh, activity on the other side of the border from Russia, if they don't give that information, then they can be prosecuted. Um, and if they don't collaborate in other ways, like uh, moving supplies for, uh, for Russia's forces, then they can be prosecuted. So we can see that these people are being brought in uh, as accomplices to the war. Like I said, um, we know that this involves police forces or police officers and border guards, partly because there are uh, online forums for law enforcement agents um, where they discuss it, they, rec <coughs> they recommend it to each other as a supplement to their uh, working income or their pension income. They post photographs of their metal detector and shovel. Uh, this is very open and it, I found, I have found dozens of examples just from open access online forums for law enforcement agents and for cultural property criminals. In fact, there's there are a few, at least, uh, a few online communities of cultural property criminals where they 
celebrate police day every year and their conversations include their congratulations of their other members or uh, the members thanking other people for uh, celebrating that day. So like I say, this leads to a situation where people don't really think that the law exists. They talk about public cases. Uh, there was someone who was prosecuted for uh, destroying uh, <coughs> Kirk and burial mounds and being fined 25,000 for 25. So then people talked online about the fact, well, if it only costs 1,000 rubles for, uh, or 1,000 uh, hryvnia for each uh, kurgan, they could get together and split the cost of the fine and then treat each uh, act of looting as a, as a weekend break. They talk about whether they should continue because they're on these lists um, or whether uh, they should start the... Um, they even joke about the fact or complain about the fact that um, the, only th the only difference between them and the people who, who are being caught is first of all, that the people who get caught are stupid enough to do it incompetently and second, that they themselves are stupid enough not to get involved themselves and make money. There's this whole idea in the community and spreading into citizens like, why am I the, like, the only person who's not making money? I must be stupid not to be committing this crime. And it does sadly involve soldiers and fighters on both sides. So for example, this guy, uh, he uh, serves on Ukraine's side. Uh, I found him because I was looking for, <coughs> for looters and his social media profile showed that he was a soldier. Uh, on the other side, uh russian forces or russian supporters found him because they were looking for soldiers uh and we all found the same profile and this is one of the reasons that i've edited these images because uh he is now being threatened with a tribunal in the occupied territories if he's caught and obviously the punishment that he would receive uh, would be unconscionable. However, there is a clear leaning among cultural property criminals towards um, nationalist thought, so much so that people within the community or around the community themselves say uh, that even the looters in Ukraine, a lot of them are Russian nationalists and a, uh, a noticeable number actually volunteered to fight, have volunteered to fight ever since 2014. Uh, <clears throat> and we know their ideologies a lot of the time because they talk about them very publicly. Uh, the, the man in the top left here has been in intelligence, ultra-nationalist extremism uh, on the side of Ukraine. And for a long time, he was getting into arguments with um, former partners in crime uh, in Russia. And then once the war started, and it became obviously more salient as an issue, uh, the Russians started arguing among themselves about the fact that they had cooperated with him before. And they said, well, you know, 
we all knew he was a Nazi uh, in the sense of an extremist. Um, but it wasn't a problem back then. However, now his activity is being used by the Russian side to produce propaganda to argue that Ukraine is financing its war by looting and trafficking of antiquities. And that's being used to give the shamelessly false impression that Russia is both a more patriotic and a more effective governor than Ukraine. I'll close with just a few more examples of the uh, various ways that all of this is, all of the crime is tied up with all of the violence. So we know that uh, even in mine clearing, where obviously capacity to use a metal detector is a valuable skill, um, there are people who are looting antiquities while they are clearing mines. So that is another thing that we're going to have to be conscious of in the late stages of the conflict and in the early stages of recovery. Uh, mine clearing organizations or their employees are even re recruiting uh, mine clearers through communities for antiquities looting. And those recruiters are advertising the fact that they are allowed to loot antiquities, uh, which they're clearly not. Um, but the the organization itself will not regulate and does not condemn, let alone uh, prohibit the losing of antiquities in the process of the clearing of mines. This is just to show how widely the ideologies spread. But like I say, there is a leaning towards nationalism on both sides. Um, and that's even now got to the extent that uh, anti-war looters in Russia are being denounced and prosecuted, and they're being denounced by other antiquities looters. Even in the uh, network around those who shot down flight MH17, a lot of the communication was being run through uh, antiquarian forums where the members of that network were already known and well known because of their activity. Um, and as you can see here, one member of that network, uh, Igor Ukrainets, uh, had a photo on social media of himself in civilian clothing with a metal detector. And it's a uh, it is a metal detector rather than a mine detector. Uh, so it looks like people in the network were not only collecting, but extracting archaeological goods. Um, some of them have been given as gifts in reward for participation in the war, like St. George Crosses. Some of the collaborators have posted <coughs> have posted evidence that they collaborated with the invasion. So uh, at the top left is a medal that someone posted who, who was celebrating the fact that uh, he assisted in the occupation of Crimea. And through that, through the displacement of the authorities, uh, he gained access to land to loot. That's possibly the clearest example of the uh, mutual influence and reward, the, this positive feedback loop between crime and violence, where uh, each facilitates and incentivizes the other. And to come back to um, the image from the title slide, this is uh, a photo of the flag of um, the Cossack National Guard, which is internationally sanctioned. Um, and it was uh, posted by people in uniform uh, in an online community that self-identifies as 
uh, black market diggers who operate exclusively in the occupied territories of Donetsk. So again, like very clear, very proud uh, connections between crime and violence. And this is just, uh, these are just other examples of uh, here, the kind of antiquities that are being looted and extracted during the war. Uh, and this stuff is, I'll close with this, this stuff is reaching the market. Sanctions don't work very well. I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have them, but we have to be very conscious that they don't work very well. Um, the looters talk about the fact that uh, smuggling may be slower, it may be more expensive. They have to decide between uh, accepting the cost themselves and having a lower profit margin or increasing the prices to compensate. But they can just transship things through countries like Georgia and Kazakhstan and then onwards into Western markets. And they are reaching Western markets. There have been collectors in the Netherlands who've been investigating this and they've repeatedly identified objects that came from Ukraine, Russia and Belarus and other zones of conflict and crisis as well um, that are on the market in uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Spain, France, the United Kingdom uh, with false provenances which suggest that they've been in uh, West for decades. Um, but we, but we know they've arrived there only three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, six months ago, because they the dealers have been using the same photographs that they were uh, supplied by the looters. So the collectors have been able to do reverse image searches and find the original adverts of the objects um, when they were being looted in the first place. So I would, uh, I would only close with this. This activity can't effectively be policed, very obviously. It can't effectively be policed either in Ukraine because it has no spare capacity or in Russia because it doesn't want to. It will only be activity in the West, uh, in the Western markets to uh, combat this crime, to combat this uh, flow of finances to criminals and to uh, violent political extremists that will be able to achieve anything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, for your great presentation. Please, uh, dear colleagues, do you have some questions to Sam? You can write it in uh, our chat or simple ask. Okay, we are waiting on questions and uh, uh, Sam, I have also uh, some questions. So, uh, we can differentiate. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, sorry. So we can differentiate looting and uh, trafficking like on governmental level and uh, on average people level. But um, if you speak about governmental level and especially, for example, uh, this case with gold from Crimea. Yes, in Netherlands and uh, and um, and uh, Germany. And it was also interesting case because yes, it's like our our heritage and the Ukraine has to get such gold, but at the same time we had such law and we have such law that this gold is in possession of museums from the Crimea, but Crimea is occupied. And that's the question, what to do in such case, yes? And how to prevent such situation is like uh, one, uh, the first question. But another question about this 
like average people level. At the same time, it, it is also controlled, as you told, from untouchable person, because like many traffics, they are controlled of politicians. And, uh, but at the same time, for example, this Crimea is quite understandable and we can, we can in the future find some possibilities to return some part of our heritage. But on this average people level, it's like impossible because no one knows who and what steal all. Yeah, uh, and it's, it is grimly funny when, when an untouchable is finally touched. You see people saying, well, why didn't they arrest that one and that one and that one as well? It's so well known which people are involved in this kind of thing. There was a comment one time where, where someone said, oh, well, you know, um, like, oh, this president's notorious for having a collection of uh, uh, Tripillion, uh, Neolithic uh, antiquities. And he was wrong um, because it was a different president. Uh, but in fact, he had been gifted ne Neolithic antiquities by this other president who was his, you know, publicly his sworn enemy. Um, and that level of complicity and, and like the, yeah, the way all of this in a sense is a game for the powerful uh, makes it very difficult to, to combat. Um, at least, at least with the case of the Crimean uh, artifacts in the Netherlands, it was possible for them to say, well, we will return them to Ukraine when we can, and Ukraine will return them to Crimea when it can. But sadly, we all know that if this stuff goes to Crimea now, it goes to Russia. Um, I, I'm, I'm very confident that the people fighting to get this stuff back for Ukraine wanted to go back to Crimea, but they wanted to go back to a free Crimea where it will stay in the free Crimea. Uh, and I'm fairly confident that some of the people who were campaigning for it to go back to Crimea, uh, at least some of them would have been doing it partly because they knew they couldn't do anything else. I suspect they would have been glad that they failed because Again, they were Crimean, and they did want this stuff back, but they wanted to be back for their own community, not for it to be stolen from them again, um, along with the other stuff that's already been taken. Yeah. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Some other questions about looting and trafficking of antiquities. Yes, we have a question from Abir Ben Ali. Uh, what countermeasures could be done essentially, essentially, if these crimes are not often advertised in darknet? Yeah, sadly, uh, this crime often doesn't reach the darknet simply because it doesn't need to, um, because it isn't being uh, effectively monitored, let alone policed. They can sell this stuff in online forums, in uh, Facebook and their contactor groups or wherever else. Um, I think we could and should be supporting uh, teams of investigators, uh, both in Ukraine and outside, to support all of the committed professionals in Eastern Europe and beyond, because there are people in Russia and Belarus who don't want this stuff to happen. It's difficult to cooperate with them right now, but they are on the right side of the war and the right side of this problem. Um, so we need to find ways to support them to be able to do their jobs and to support their society uh, and to help it to advance despite uh, the war. Um, because they will be able to identify the criminals, to identify uh, the most serious criminals who need to be targeted first. 
Um, but um, and we need to support local law enforcement because at the moment they as well naturally are overstretched or taken away to deal with other problems. Um, so they need to be trained to understand why they need to investigate this as well as drugs and arms and all the rest. But I think the safest, most effective way uh, to act against it is to improve and increase the policing in the market countries, um, especially because that's where most of the money stays and it's where almost all of the money comes from. It, it is, again, uh, it is known to the criminals at the end, at the source end, that the rich people abroad get away with buying this stuff. And again, that is, apart from being simply morally offensive, it's socially destructive, and it really undermines any effort to police this crime because they quite rightly say why should they not do this if the rich people in these other countries can do this thank you very much it's always like ethical problem ethical issue and uh, one more question from Christos Christos please Yes, thank you, Sam, for a very informative talk. Um, I wanted to ask, what is usually the reaction of those people in social media once they find out that they are being followed for such kind or other kind of research? Um, do they disappear? Do they change names? Do they get frustrated? Do they mind or they just feel that they are untouchable and they continue to do that knowing that either probably or for sure they are being followed uh, for research study reasons, something else, other options also. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting thing. You see them talking about the fact that they're being monitored. They will advise each other, you know, uh, you should post fewer photos of the objects that you're looting. You would think the advice would be none, but like they, they just like make it a be a bit more subtle uh i've seen someone in serbia say that he wasn't going to post any more self-incriminating evidence until he had escaped the prosecution <laughs> that he was currently facing um but a lot of the time they treat it as a joke there's a conversation i found recently where uh Alutu was talking about the fact that, you know, he was pulled over by the police and he was really panicking because he was, he'd been caught in the act and the police officer was really uh, testing him, searching the car, questioning him, all the rest of it, make, really making him sweat. And then right at the end, the police officer uh, said, don't worry, I'm one as well. Like it, and that, yeah, they, they really don't care or they don't worry, seriously. Uh, they treat getting caught as basically as a cost of business or a risk of business. Um, so monitoring, they don't worry about. I think the the more serious criminals are naturally more careful. So the kind of people who would handle the kind of objects that you see, uh, they would be more careful. But the people who are supplying masses of material dredged up at quite low value, they know that there are so many of them that they don't need to panic. Um, and also, yeah, they, they're resigned to it. They know that they, if they're going to get prosecuted, they're going to get prosecuted. And it doesn't matter whether they're guilty or not. So then they kind of 
give up and let themselves enjoy it. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much, Samuel, for your so interesting presentation. And just now we have so great discussion. And uh, just now we will move forward because if we speak about illicit trade, it's also always the questions of money and how to identify such financial flows that uh, are going from from illicit trade. That is why just now I'd like to invite uh, our colleague, Dr. Marina Shiranova uh, from Slovak Academy of Sciences with topic measurement of illicit financial flows from a macro level. Maria works as senior researcher at the Institute of Economic Research of the Slovak Academy of Sciences where she serves as the head of the Department of Macrofinancial Analysis. Her key areas of research include topics from empirical monetary economics, international finance, with special focus on capital flows and macroeconomic imbalances, and financial geography issues. Currently, she is a lead researcher in a project aimed at investigating the link between shadow banking and illicit financial flows in European countries. Articles which she co-authored were published in several, several uh, notable field journals, including Journal of Financial Stability, Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, Review of International Economics, and European Financial Management. So Maria, floor is yours, please. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, uh, I would like to thank all the attendees uh, for attending the seminar. So my presentation will be uh, from a slightly different angle uh, since I'm a uh, macroeconomist by training. Um, so um, I will be basically providing uh, you some uh, review of current uh, uh, trends uh, and approaches how to measure uh, illicit financial flows, but from the macro level perspective, so on the country level. Plus, um, I will be also discussing our ongoing project uh, that is exactly related to the um, uh, issue of shadow banking uh, and illicit financial flows. Uh, under the shadow banking, you know, there is a broad definition um, of the shadow banking that is used. Uh, but uh, to link my presentation a little bit to the uh, previous speaker, we can talk also about the use of cryptocurrencies uh, like Bitcoin um, and different uh, channels, how to transfer money from home economy, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for, from the um, uh, target economy to your home economy via, let's say, Havala uh, uh, a network. Um, so basically, the, the exactly this part of the money um, of this working group one um, uh, topic. So what are illicit financial flows? Um, the definition is again rather broad. Uh, there are already some attempts to provide uh, a more comprehensive uh, definition. Basically, some people, they focus on this uh, uh, motivations uh, standing behind the illicit financial flows, uh, saying that everything that has been illegally earned, transferred, or used uh, can be labeled as, uh, uh, as uh, somehow uh, funded by illicit financial flows. Um, then you can look at the uh, subjects who are engaged um, in um, these economic activities uh, because you know the purpose is to bribe someone or to uh, avoid paying taxes. Uh, so basically you can distinguish um, among those motives related to criminal, individual or corporate um, uh, IFF. Um, but basically some people say that, uh, you know, everything that uh, is sort of like in this gray area between legal and illegal already can be labeled as illicit. Um, so, so basically, we should look at this as a, as a one, uh, as a, as a one uh, big, huge bucket uh, that, that uh, uh, everything can go with it, can go into it. Um, I, I found a very nice um, a scheme that has been produced by United Nations um, that actually links all those elements uh, into one comprehensive framework. So on the left side, you have these components of uh, internet 
um, international financial, uh, so easy financial flows. Um, so we can talk now about the motivation. So again, corruption related, tax related, etc. Then in the middle, um, you look at the channels, how the money is to, um, um, is transmitted um, between the um, among the economies. Um, in our research, uh, in the past project that's been already completed, um, we focused on uh, this uh, trade misinvoicing either uh, among the unrelated uh, trade parties or within these multinational enterprises. Um, but I, we have also some uh, research uh, contributions done on the capital account channel that usually goes via foreign trade investment uh, shell companies that are established uh, in a, a tax haven countries, uh, uh, financial center territories, etc. So, so basically all those companies that are um, set up uh, in, in a country, in the territory, not because of some fulfilling uh, a fundamentally economic purpose, I don't know, providing goods to the final consumers, but really just to optimize your uh, um, your taxes. And then at the end, uh, of course, the ultimate goal of, uh, of uh, illicit financial flows is to, is to be uh, transformed into some form of asset. Uh, again, it can be in a form of art or these antiquities, uh, but, you know, once we broaden the, uh, the scope, then we can talk about uh, purchasing real assets in, uh, in the London, in the Paris, for example, uh, or basically to, uh, to purchase some shares of hedge funds uh, I don't know, in uh, Luxembourg, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ultimately, you know, there are various forms uh, that this illicit financial flows can uh, take on. Um, so in our completed project and in a, in a res uh, and in the research that I am uh, describing today, uh, very briefly, we were looking uh, at these measurements, uh, ways how to at least somehow approximate the extent of uh, uh, illicit financial flows on the country level. Um, so basically, we were looking at the so-called trade based measures uh, when you compare uh, official um, uh, reports on export and import uh, volumes. Uh, between the countries, and basically the discrepancy uh, among them can be somehow attributed to this kind of extent of, um, of uh, illicit trade. Uh, again, with the assumption that at least uh, one of the country involved reports correctly. Um, of course, there is like this kind of huge black uh, market that is not even covered by the official uh, statistics. Uh, but about that, you know, there are obviously some indirect estimates that uh, we cannot, at this point, we cannot do anything about it. Uh, um, so then there are some approaches that try to look at this measurement of capital, uh, illicit financial flows uh, from this financial perspective. Again, measuring the discrepancies in the macroeconomic uh, statistics, balance of payment statistics. Uh, and again, comparing what has been reported by, let's say, more advanced economies, higher rule of law, hopefully uh, uh, correct statistic is produced there uh, with, let's say, with the statistic that is produced uh, by the least developed countries uh, that we know uh, is, uh, is very uh, rough and unprecise. Um, and there is a huge literature on uh, international corporate uh, uh, tax avoidance. Um, we don't work on that, but there are some colleagues also in Czech Republic, for example, working on the uh, on this issue. So there are already some estimates uh, um, produced that basically look at the individual uh, um, uh, corporate uh, balance sheets and uh, um, uh, profit and loss uh, statements. And they try to find some inconsistencies uh, um, in this uh, in the data, so they can derive at least some kind of rough estimate of illicit financial flows. Uh, but so usually for the purpose of this tax uh, um, evasion. So um, I will jump jump directly into our contribution. It's been already uh, published. So we look at this uh, estimate of the trade-based measures. Um, we already have some uh, that are produced by the Global Financial Integrity Report. Uh, the problem with this data is that uh, they are produced only for a set of emerging economies. Um, and the second, basically, they assume um, that uh, what is 
reported by the most advanced economies is the true value of, of the trade um, of the trade volumes, while in reality we have some not only anecdotal evidence, but what I will show you also uh, in this presentation, we know that even at the side of the develop, most developed countries, um, there is a lot going on in the in the trade statistics uh, uh, that is unprecise, that is probably uh, related to um, illicit trade. Uh, so even you know these most advanced economies, they have some uh, statistical discrepancies in the data. Um, so basically, in our uh, research, we decided to produce estimates of trade needs reporting for uh, the world sample, so not only the uh, emerging economies, as the G, uh, GSI uh, um, does. Um, and we also decided to um, econometrically uh, tackle the other issue of so-called fixed transaction costs. Um, Usually, people who try to estimate at least um, as some 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 minimum level of trade needs reporting, they sort of like a hypothesis uh, impose a restriction on the transaction cost being at a certain level, usually like the ten percent uh, of the export values on the imported side. Uh, but again, as we as we show, this is but as also other uh, contributions showed, this is a, a very rough estimate and it's not. Um, um warranted anymore that the 10 percent level that's been uh, in the past also advocated by the IMF is correct one. In reality, this the level of transaction cost it really depends on the characteristics of the counterparties involved in uh, uh, in the in, in the international trade. So we also realize this assumption of the fixed cost, a fixed transaction cost. Um, we do it on the country level, um, but there is a contribution by Kob Hamjanski and Maresh uh, who look at this trade gap, called trade gap uh, uh, decomposition uh, at the product level. So they dig much deeper into it. So if you want to uh, check them, definitely check their paper. Um, because our story is not uh, only not on the misreporting on the product level. But our story is also about this kind of relaxing this transaction cost assumption, plus showing that with this data we can tell some story also about the uh, interaction of um, um, exporters and importer characteristics. So at the end, we produced uh, like what well, those are the findings. We produced uh, three um, uh, specific combinations. Uh, of exporter and importer that we claim are the most likely to get engaged in misreporting practices. Um, okay, so this is just to show you that when you plot this um, uh, trade gap difference, which measures the difference in the reporting values of uh, export and import um, between two countries, then uh, you can clearly see that you know there is a uh, there is some uh, heterogeneity, uh, and this is something that is to be expected because by stat uh, by this, um, um, statistic statistical principle, um, the import values usually differ from export values due to this tip spot uh, principle by let's say ten percent or fifty percent. This is exactly you know these transaction costs that are usually added to the export value uh, are borne by the importer and are completely natural. Um, uh, but the problem is that basically when you look at the distribution across the countries, even for the United States, uh, you clearly see that this, uh, for some specific countries, um, we can see like uh, 10 times of the steep cost ratio or 15 uh, times of the, um, of the steep cost ratio. Not only that, you even see a negative uh, steep cost ratio that basically by economic logic should be not, uh, you know, uh, observable. Um, so, so that's telling you a story that really even those most developed countries, they are not, they are really sensitive also towards this uh, reporting issue. Um, and the second um, second observation that can be drawn from this picture uh, is this bottom row, 
that, for example, when you limit your sample, just to look at the data for the trade between among the developed group uh, of countries. Um, so, for example, um, uh, European uh, Union countries and the Canada and the US, even there, what you basically see uh, is that there is some level um, of uh, misreporting in the official data. Uh, for example, for Austria, again, you see even some negative numbers or, you know, this default ratio that is supposed to be maximum up to, I don't know, 0 0.2. For some specific instances, you can, you know, see uh, 1.5 uh, times the uh, um, uh, 1.5 uh, 1 uh, ratio. Um, okay, so what do we do? Uh, we basically just collect the uh, the data on the international uh, trade with goods, so uh, not the services, just, just the goods. Uh, we calculate this uh, um, trade gap. Um, we call it like trade discrepancy. And we hypothesize that this trade discrepancy in the data, uh, so the difference between the import values and the export values, uh, the reported by bilateral um, uh, partners, they should be driven by a completely natural um, uh, uh, transaction cost. Um, then there is, of course, some error components. You have uh, a different practices. Uh, you have time uh, like error, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So some error is to be expected in the data. That's again completely natural. But then you will have something that uh, will be contribute uh, will be attributed to some usual suspects, uh, some determinants of uh, trade misreporting, and that will be in this uh, and we call it the true extent of misreporting practices, this uh, third element in the equation. So we just run uh, the regressions, um, you know, bunch of control variables, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we sort of like a disaggregate this trade gap into, into various elements. Uh, some characteristics are uh, attributed to the export uh, partner country. Some characteristics, characteristics are attributed to the import um, um, partner country. And then there is something that we call a pair effect. So the interaction between the particular characteristic of an exporter and uh, an importer, and of course, you know, some, some residuals. Um, so here are the outcomes of the regression. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I will not go through each one of them. Uh, the paper is already out, so, you know, just read it. Uh, but basically, the first part uh, of, uh, of the regressors, the, the first five elements, uh, they can be labeled as, as uh, the aspects of the economic distance. Uh, so like a true distance measured in kilometers or miles. Um, then some bunch of dummy variables, whether you have some colonial history, that everything goes back to so-called gravity regression in uh, um, uh, trade literature. Um, and this should somehow capture, you know, this uh, normal true transaction cost uh, because, of course, the higher the distance uh, between the trading partners, usually the higher the transaction cost. Uh, cost of insurance, freight costs, everything should be somehow, you know, everything there should be captured by these uh, five variables. But then we have some variables on top of that, uh, like the control of corruption, um, a variable capital account openness, uh, uh, trade openness as well, uh, the level of financial development of the countries that should capture, you know, this very specific role played by financial centers, such as, I don't know, Singapore, Macau, et cetera, et cetera. Um, inflation, exchange rate regimes, because the literature says that basically uh, um, economic agents from countries that have uh, capital controls in place they try to circumvent all those capital controls by various means, for example, by using cryptocurrencies. So we control for all of these, let's say, usual suspects as determinants of the uh, trade gap. And on top of that, that's our contribution, we also add the interaction uh, that, as I said, will uh, sort of like a capture this very, very particular combination of some characteristic trade uh, of the trade partners.
Um, so when you look at the outcomes of the regression, what we can observe is that really this uh, uh, interactive term is, uh, in most of the cases, it's statistically significant. So it really tells you that not only your individual country specific barrier uh, um, uh, traits matter, but also you know the combination of the trade partners matter. Um, and since you know econometrically this is sort of like already a complicated setup because of the bilateral fixed effects, interaction terms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I will not bother you with the interpretation results. Um, you can find them in the paper, but I will sort of like summarize our main message uh, in these four um, uh, bullet points. So the first one is that what we usually observe is that the missed reporting in trade volumes is observed, especially among the poorer peers. So really, you know, between the, let's say, Afri two African countries, uh, or, you know, when uh, the goods are shipped from the low to high income countries. So again, from Africa to, let's say, Netherlands. Uh, that's something that's been already discussed in the literature. Uh, and in our data or in our model, we can, we can also see it and confirm it. The second thing is, um, um, that usually you observe this kind of misreporting when there is a shipment of goods from uh, uh, from an exporter um, who is characterized by high taxes, corporate taxes, uh, and at that at, and and it this this uh, goods are shipped to a country um, where an importer. Um, usually as in an environment of low taxes. Uh, and that basically smells of uh, this kind of profit uh, optimization motivation of the multinational firms, for example, but also of unrelated parties. Um, in that case, we will observe this so-called under invoicing of export because that will lower your uh, uh, tax base. Uh, and you will also observe over invoicing on the side of the uh, importer because you know the importer has this uh, lower tax, um, corporate tax. So the multinationals can sort of like issue fake invoices uh, just to exploit this tax uh, tax rate differential. Uh, and the third um, message here is that we also observe this kind of shipment of um, or the misreporting practices between the parties where. Uh, the receiver of capital um, is like a financial center economy, while um, on the importer side, we observe the financially repressed economy. So really less developed financial system where your money cannot be probably transformed uh, into some uh, high yield uh, uh, assets. Um, so this is also the combination that is uh, the most conducive to um, misreporting practices in uh, trade. And the last message is that um, the exporter trades are really important in uh, identifying uh, um, whether the country will engage in uh, misreporting practices, uh, not maybe the importer side, but predominantly the exporter side is what drives our results. Uh, we also produced like a ranking of countries, some database uh, where you can look at the so-called empirical, so the rough data, just the comparison of import and export values, and this like a net data, net of transaction costs, uh, and just the, this element that can be the hypothesis attributed to the uh, uh, trade misreporting. Um, so what is, for example, interesting, or what was very interesting for, for us to find out is that uh, also the countries from the Central Europe uh, are prone to this issue, like Hungary. Uh, Hungary is a very nice example of a country where empirically everything is fine. Um, your empirical uh, discrepancy between import and export values is like 5%. So that's nothing that can be really attributed at first sight to the transaction costs. But once you sort of like to clean the data, uh, then you just realize that uh, uh, this, this over, invo over invoicing of imports values in Hungary sort of like a triple, uh, more than triples even. Um, then what we do is that uh, we also compare our results with the data, this official data from the Global Financial Integrity Reports that were only produced for developing countries. And again, for example, I would like to draw your attention to the case of Hungary. 
uh, you see again official data even by the GFI estimates uh, are something like around I mean one percent. Uh, because you deduct uh, from this 5% the estimation of the transaction cost, so it's almost nothing. But in our case, um, we produce uh, this kind of extent of, uh, of misreporting um, at a much higher uh, scale. So the other message is here um, that um, not only the emerging economies are prone to misreporting of their trade volumes, it is also the problem of let's say, transition economy here in, in Europe, but um, definitely, you know, the data for maybe um, uh, Netherlands uh, are somehow uh, misreported. Um, this is just the outcome of this formal uh, testing, uh, what drives the results, the difference between other data and the other as our estimates and these uh, GFI estimates. Um, at one point, this is the inclusion uh, of the transaction, the better, more proper measure of the transaction cost. Uh, but it depends also on the size of an economy. So it looks like that uh, the GFI data, they produce higher misreporting estimates for predominantly bigger uh, economies than our economies um, that we have in our sample. Okay, and I would like to uh, finish my presentation with uh, just giving you um, uh, an illustration of uh, what we are currently working on, uh, what we are looking at. So hopefully in the future we can collaborate as well. Uh, so as I said, now we are now sort of like uh, departing from this uh, um, uh, trade estimates, misreporting estimates, and we are now focusing on the financial on the role of a financial system, especially the so-called shadow banking uh, financial system, uh, because it looks like that, uh, you know, the official data are really uh, distorted, especially in the case of foreign direct investment. Um, so we have already one uh, draft of the paper working on this misreporting in the for official uh, foreign direct investment data. It looks like that this, um, you know, if you remember the first message uh, that I told you was about this role of uh, financial centers, so financially developed economies versus financially, let's say, depressed economies. So now we want to look at the role of uh, financial centers and uh, tax havens um, in, in serving as a conduit. Uh, of this illicit financial flow. So we would like to do something on the so-called financial geography of the shadow banking. Um, uh, so basically how the financial uh, flows are um, uh, sort of like uh, uh, are concentrated um, via financial centers uh, as a conduit. There, they, they are somehow mixed. They are uh, uh, purified. And somehow suddenly what has been linked to um, illegal activity is transformed into completely normal stock uh, uh, share in the hedge funds, uh, or maybe it is left there in the um, uh, in the so-called special purpose vehicles or special purpose entities companies. Uh, so that's something that we are now considering. And the, the last thing that I forgot to mention is that so we would like to use this approach that we did uh, and we used already for uh, trade news reporting and trade goods for trade in services, uh, because it turns out that uh, uh, with this advent of uh, financial centers, um, you know, the data for bilateral trades in services are so um, misreported with so many gaps that we think that it would be nice to do this kind of uh, trade gap exercise also for the um, uh, for the trade with services um, uh, database. Okay, so I am at the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for um, for your time and patience. And um, yeah, I am open to the questions, uh, comments, and the discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Maria. For so great presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, do you have some questions for Maria? Mm, uh, okay, maybe I, I can I can start. Uh, Maria, you mentioned also uh, corruption like variable 
that you take into account when you provided such modeling? And uh, what was the indicator like? Uh... Yeah. Um, yeah, with, with the corruption, it's always tricky to measure the uh, uh, the extent of corruption. Usually, you only have this survey based uh, estimates. So, what people perceive is the level of the corruption in the country. So, formally, we use the uh, control of corruption uh, variable uh, that is officially produced. Um, so. Basically, we take it as a as a given. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, it, it's uh, on the scale between uh, zero to let's say ten, um, and it's called control for, uh, of corruption. Um, so basically, how well the judiciary system is able, you know, to uh, investigate the cases of corruption and punish, you know, the people responsible for that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so. That's something that's been uh, usually um, employed in this kind of empirical study. Uh, but yeah, we all know that um, measuring the corruption levels is uh, it's a very tricky thing to do. Thank you very much, colleagues. Please, in also you can type your questions in uh, our chat. And uh, also one more question about shadow banking. And because, you know, we speak just now about illicit trade, and what do you mean under shadow banking? Because if we take um, general literature about shadow banking, it will be about securitization issues. And your meaning, the meaning of shadow banking is the same, or it's more about illicit trade? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so. So far, um, there have been like two concepts developed. So one is this kind of like a broad concept of shadow banking. That's exactly what you mentioned. So uh, inside of, uh, of this shadow banking system, you have a completely normal, well-functioning uh, elements of financial markets. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know, the hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds. Uh, um, so. That's like a broad one, but even within this broad one, you have this narrow concept of the so-called office, so other financial uh, institutions, and there you also have basically it's called like a residual category, and within this residual fact, uh, category, you can put everything uh, that at least somehow is related to uh, uh, to financial either financial markets or just you know has something to do with finance. So some people they already um, associate uh, fintech companies, you know, with this office category. Uh, there are uh, attempts to include at least some estimates of cryptocurrency trading uh, into this part of this residual uh, category. Uh, category. Uh, so of course, for us, you know, we need to or we would like to look also at these official or well-functioning elements of the shadow banking that are at least somehow regulated already. Um, but we also have some ideas, uh, some people working on the cryptocurrencies um, because there you have lots of anecdotal evidence, you know, that, uh, yeah, uh, Darknet, uh, we heard about that, and, and then Bitcoin, that's just the, the, the primary objective of that. It's not the primary, but uh, a very important, yeah. very important objective is just to use it to, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Maria. I suggest that we also will meet in Skopje and we'll continue to discuss uh, today's topics as well. And uh, dear colleagues, so for today uh, we can finish our discussion and also please follow our YouTube channel where you can find previous webinars as well. And just now in chat, you have link to such webinars. And uh, for today, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much for your discussion. And uh, let's see us on next yeah. webinars. And of course, in Skopje. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I see that some uh, also uh, some wrote some question, I think. Uh, so uh, if some can stay here, we can discuss it or we can discuss it in Skopje if he's coming. Yes, yes, yes. I don't right. know. Some, some, what do you think? Um, well,
well, whether it was more productive to put them in declarations or wealthier countries, uh, well, it depends on the purpose. Uh, I think it would be easier uh, among the richer countries to cooperate uh, with each other. Um, because you know, with this uh, the, the connection between the wealth, uh, the wealthier countries and the poorer countries, there is, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, it, it's trickier on the side of these uh, uh, of the more poorer countries um, because there the institutions are just not working. I think in case of uh, of wealthier, richer countries, at least you know we have some ground rules for some. Institutions, uh, we have this ambition to sort of like a, uh, uh, at least try to um, legally uh, being able to put them in jail. While you know, in the poorer countries, the institutions are just not working. So I think it would be very difficult, you know, to uh, to uh, to impose something like that. Yes, Sam. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, for today is over. Thank you very much. And we will meet in future as well, online and offline, face to face. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.